Thank you, everybody. Uh, hi, my name is Nikki Shavak, and I'm one of the partners at Blackbird. I'm going to start us off with a few questions, um, but we'd love to um, ask your own. So make sure you're uh, entering your questions into Slido, so sli.do, and then enter in the, the sunrise. Um, the first question I had was um, going back to this sort of seminal period of Canva and your search for a technical founder and, and eventually uh, finding Cam. Um, love to sort of uh, rewind uh, and sort of get your original beliefs on how you find a good technical founder um, and that process. And then in those years since, um, you know, what have you learned about assessing technical people and how uh, good and bad people are? Yeah. So with our first company, we outsourced the development. So we had an amazing software company that we used. And I think that that was really beneficial because it really helped to us to get a lot more credentials, learn how to do things like product management, learn how to market a company, and actually build up a little bit more um, uh, skills and brownie points <laughs> to be able to get an amazing um, tech team. And then I met Lars Rasmussen, who co-founded Google Maps, um, on my second day in San Francisco. Bill introduced me to him. And he said that he'd be a technical advisor. But what that actually entailed was a year of him just rejecting everyone I brought him. So, <laughs> which was really not that fun. Um, <laughs> it was actually very frustrating at the time. But I think what was really beneficial about that was he knew the technical complexity of what we needed to build. Um, and so he ensured that we set the technical bar at the level that we needed to be able to build this huge world-changing company. Um, and uh, so he rejected everyone, the people I brought him, the LinkedIn messages that I, I brought, sent him LinkedIn links, I sent him resumes as I brought him physical people, and he rejected everyone. Um, which was very frustrating, but I think very impactful in the end because we ended up with an amazing co-founder, Cameron. Um, and then we also ended up with an incredible CTO, Dave Herndon. And so I think that by set, and they'd both worked at Google before on Google Wave. And so they'd built big um, technology before they had scaled rapidly. So I don't know what the lesson is to take out from that, but mm. I think that... What, what <laughs> questions do you ask uh, technical people when you interview them now um, and bringing them on to Canva, perhaps? So that um, so we, because we had such a high technical bar to start with, they really got to set the foundations for our technical interview process. Um, and so in all of our hiring, we try to have, we, there's a, th a three-stage process where people do an at-home challenge, people then do an in-person challenge and an interview. Um, and so the hiring processes have become very, um, a, a very sophisticated process to try to help ensure that people who start on the job are really successful. Um, for example, you know, we had an intern and grad program. We had 1,100 applicants, which was just completely crazy. Wow. Um, but I think it's been it's been really important that we had the the people, the t the early people in your company really set the foundations um, for for everything. And what about um, you find someone who's incredibly talented? How do you convince them to join Canva <laughs> when it's Cliff and yourself? That's a great question. So if you look up the bizarre pitch deck on Google, <laughs> we're the number one result. Uh, <laughs> literally. Um, so uh, I was trying to convince Dave Herndon to join from Google. Um, and Google said that his project was going to die if he joined our company. And he's a really lovely person. And you don't want to let your teammates down and have your company die. <laughs> um, and so what I did, I went onto his Facebook and I took lots of his Facebook photos and I put together this story and I was like, told the story of how, um, you know, if he joined Canva, he was going to be able to build this world changing company and that he was sad and alone at Google and he was, <laughs> it was it's actually quite funny, you should actually. <laughs> so well, I guess, I guess, I try, kind of just tried everything under the sun um, and Fortunately, that didn't creep him out. That he, <laughs> he thought that was good and actually joined our team. Excellent. Um, talk a little <laughs> bit about... <laughs> I don't know if that was what you were looking for. <laughs> um, building Canva in the beginning and choosing when to launch it, um, there's a lot of sort of default advice as to, hey, launch as early as you can, it should be embarrassing, um, uh, et cetera, et cetera. I seem to remember um, there were a few moments where you thought um, you had an idea in your mind as to how you might like to launch. You did a few user testing um, interviews. Talk about your decision of when to launch Canva and you know, perhaps your advice uh, to the audience as to you know, too early or too late or just the right time. That's a great question. So you know how I went through the process of um, saying we raised all this money from all these amazing investors, including Blackbird, who were very early on for us. We then went and 
I had one slide, one year of development. That one year of development, investors were like, what the hell are you doing with our money? <laughs> and people, investors were quite regularly messaging me, being like, are you launching yet? <laughs> um, but what was really important was we knew we needed to build the future of publishing, and it was actually there was a lot of work involved in setting the foundations for that. Um, when we had built this product, we then used a, uh, there's a website called usertesting.com, which I totally recommend um, people using, um, and you can see real users using your product, and you can hear them talking through your product, um, and you can actually see a video of them using it. And what's really powerful about that is you can understand people's first impression. And after all of that work, people's first impression was actually that was, they were scared to use the product, which was not really what we were aiming for. <laughs> um, they were like, oh, I can't design. And they just kind of like made, yeah, didn't really click around very much, didn't explore. And so we spent months then perfecting the onboarding process. So um, you had, we wanted to invite the concept of play. So people needed to um, drag. We, uh, a hat onto a monkey <laughs> and change the colour of a circle and we call them the starter challenges. They were really, really small things that people needed to do to help build their confidence. Um, and when we got to the five starter challenges, then people would actually, they completely changed how they felt about Canva and how they felt about themselves because all of a sudden, within a couple of minutes, they were using Canva, feeling confident in Canva and then once they had completed the starter challenges, it, sa it said, um, now share I've completed the five star challenges, share this with the world. And so then people would post on social media that they'd completed the starter challenges, which helped um, Canva to really grow and take off because all of a sudden people were posting um, <coughs> about this. What was the moment that you uh, uh, knew that Canva would be successful? Obviously there's still so much in your mind of, of um, what to do in the future, but was there a sort of customer moment or a product moment where you thought, you know, this is this is really meaningful, and um, uh, you know, you felt good about Canva delivering upon its promise. So, two two parts to that to this answer. One, we've got twenty, a few, you know, a few more than twenty million uh, monthly active users now, but that's 062 percent of the internet population. So we've got like way far to go. <laughs> um, on the other side, I think that hearing customer stories really is what excites me. Um, and everywhere I have been going recently, you speak to someone, you're like, oh, I was actually in an Uber, in an Uber the other day. And um, <laughs> this guy just started telling me about how he was learning to use um, photo products and he had a small business. And then he started telling me about how much he loved Canva. <laughs> and I was like, I thought that was pretty cool. Yeah. Like, I, it's really, really lovely to hear the stories. Like, you know, a lady found her birth mother by creating a poster and sharing it on um, Facebook. Uh, they use Canva for wanted posters in the US at a sheriff's, a sheriff's office. Like, all of these completely bizarre and amazing stories. Um, you know, you hear about so many small businesses and non-profits that are using it. Um, I think that Canva actually helping people to achieve their goals, that's what feels really mm. worthwhile. Talk about the, the Canva value of being a force for good um, and how that's come about and introducing, I think, quite early into Canva's journey that um, culture and talk about the 1% pledge and um, the things you've done there and, and, you know, to the audience of, you know, it's never too early to, to think about. Absolutely. So we've got a two-step plan, <coughs> two very, very simple steps. Step one, build one of the world's most valuable companies, making progress. Still got a way to go. And step two, um, do the most good we can do. And I, I personally think that we underappreciate the importance of startups and companies. And I mean, I guess they're not mutually exclusive, <laughs> um, but investors and the media, um, and obviously the government. But every single person's power to shape the world that we live in. The products that you're building are literally shaping the world. Um, and I think that it's absolutely everyone's responsibility to be able to do as much good as we possibly can. Um, there's not, you know, you can't make profit or be good. Actually, we need all of these different institutions and entities to be working together to, to build the world that we live in. Um, I feel like we're so early in our, in our journey. Um, you know, it brings me great pride in seeing the nonprofits that Canva is helping and the small businesses Canva is helping. Um, but there's just, you know, we've got this non-profit program, which I'd implore you all to do if you have, if, if you have that potential, where you can give away your product for free to non-profits. Um, 
and you know, there's there's all sorts of different activities and things that we've done over the years, um, but there's just so much more that we want to do in the years to come, which you hopefully be hearing about in in time. Excellent. Um, you know, we're big believers in in mentorship, and you know, if there was one thing. Uh, Blackbird was founded on it was the idea of founders helping the next generation. Um, I think one of the really magical things Canva has done is uh, had that mentorship level at the team team level. So to have advisors and mentors, not just to the founders, mm -hmm. but to the team, talk about how that came about and um, how that's worked so far, and uh, perhaps advice for people in the audience. Yeah, absolutely. So something that we believe very much in is. Rather than having um, like Cliff and I and Cam um, having everything channeled through us, trying to get as much um, leadership going into our teams as we possibly can. So we consider ourselves 18 startups at Canva, and if we can make, and I think 13 of those are product uh, startups, okay. and then five of those are platform startups that help to make those other ones succeed. And the way, because we're trying to take on so much as a company, it's been really critical to try to help set these up for as much success as possible. And so each of the groups at Canva has big missions and goals that they're working towards. Um, and so, for example, when we did our internationalization strategy, um, our international team got mentorship from um, the head of Pinterest international strategy. And so we were able to have each of our different uh, groups at Canva really learning from the world's best. Um, and yeah, that's been a really helpful model um, that we'll continue to do, hopefully, forever more. Excellent. Let's dive into the questions. Um, some of your investor rejection feedback was because of the valuation. What made you stick with that? And that kind of valuation at that stage would be rare in New Zealand. Yeah, um, it was definitely rare in Australia. Um, I think that what we knew that we wanted to build a really big company. We'd had a company that had been profitable, that had built a big, had um, built a company that had been you know, able to sell and make money and all of the different things. Um, and we could see the, all these people out of Y Combinator were <laughs> having like double that valuation or triple that valuation. And we're like, if we're gonna, going to build a big company, it, we felt like it was kind of important to set the foundations right. Um, and so it was quite critical to us that um, the people that were investing in Canva believed in what we were trying to do. And we thought that if we priced ourselves too low, people could kind of invest because it seemed like a good deal. But what we wanted people to do was to invest because they believed in our vision. That strategy could, could have kind of gone either way, but uh, I think that in the end, we've ended up with such an incredible group of investors that really believed in us and where we were going. Another question on, did you change your business model or narrative to get investment or stick to your vision and find the right investors um, who believed in it? And um, maybe I've got an extra question to that one, which is, um, <laughs> my theory is that you never convince anyone, you just surface the believers um, uh, when pitching for investment. And um, you know, did that ring true with your own fundraising efforts? So. Yeah. So the mission and the vision never changed, but the way we articulated that changed dramatically. We revised our pitch deck after literally every investment meeting. So someone would say, um, the market's not big enough. So our early slide in our deck became the size of the market. <laughs> Another investor would say, I don't understand your industry. In fact, that was really, really common that people had no idea what we were talking about. <laughs> um, so then the, the early slides became, you know, that, the ones that I showed you actually, the, those slides was this is the industry and this is why it's so hard and complicated. Um, another investor would say, but you're the same as some other random company. And then we'd show this, this huge gap in the market um, that is being underserved. So every time we'd get some rejection, we'd refine our deck. Um, and so the mission and the vision didn't change, but the way we articulated that to help <laughs> investors understand certainly did. Um, and then I guess because of the length of time between the initial pitching, every time we'd meet with an investor, we would actually ask for advice rather than um, give them the potential to reject us. So for example, when I was meeting with Blackbird for a number of years, <laughs> um, rather than saying, hey, do you want to invest? And they could be like, no. And then that would be the end of our relationship. I'd be like, hey, can I have some advice? And then they'd give me advice time and time again. I'd keep revising our deck, and then we'd show progress towards our vision. Um, and then that just started to demonstrate that we could actually execute. And so just doing that time and time again um, was really helpful. Excellent. Has being a young woman disadvantaged you in any way? And also, wow, I'm 12, and how soon can I start on a big idea? I love Aww. that. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
So I'll start with the 12 uh, aspect. So I was 14 and I had the tiniest business ever. I made scarves and I sold them to women's shops around Perth. Um, and this was terrifying for me at the time. I would have to call up these shops and I'd be like, do you want to take my scarves on consignment? I learned that word. Consignment means you give it to them, but they don't pay until it's sold. Um, and it was very, very helpful because I think that that started me to think like, well, firstly, when people said no, despite the fact it was really painful to try again. Um, and secondly, it started to re make me realise that I could actually create a little business. Um, and so it's definitely not too young to start. 12 is a great time to start. Um, <laughs> and on the, on the gender front, I think you know, there's so many different aspects. If you look at the probability of Canva succeeding, if you look at you know, the fact of, that I was from Perth, that I was a female, that I was whatever age, that I was, you know, every single factor, like we ticked literally none of the bo normal boxes. Um, and so I think if I was looking at the statistical probability that I would have succeeded, it's probably zero, <laughs> like quite literally, uh, maybe like many, many decimal points. Um, so yeah, I think you just can't let that you know, you're going to get rejected. And I think that what I was trying to communicate today is that is not because of any particular factor. That's just because that's the same for everyone. And I, I wrote a blog post recently about this, was that most people, if you're rejected, it feels like a personal attack. And I think that if you have a reason why you think that that rejection may be because of, and that's something that isn't yeah. something that you can control, that would be really disempowering. And so it's really important to think that any rejection is based on something you can control because then you can fix that. And so for us, it was like, we're going to fix this deck. We're going to keep fixing this deck over and over again. Um, and that meant that we really had that internal locus of control, which meant that we felt like we could succeed. Excellent. Seven years into founding Canva, do you still feel driven to lead it as CEO? And if yes, do you wonder if someone else might be better at taking it to the next level? Um, I'm going to reframe it a little bit um, about how you learn how to become a great CEO because you start off as a founder, you become a CEO and all of the, I think, really wonderful first principle decisions. You talked a little bit about, about the 18 startups and um, within Canva and the team and organizational structure, the culture. How do you learn that and um, you know, what influenced your <coughs> thinking in making those, those decisions as a CEO? Yeah, th thanks. I think that... It's really important, like every stage of a company's journey, there's a path, there's a, a fork in the road. And there is do things because everyone else is doing it and do things because they feel authentic and right. And it's very easy to continue to feel like you should go and do it. Like at every stage, you're like, okay, maybe I'm gonna go be normal now. And, <laughs> and then you're like, actually, even if you try to be normal for a day, and then you're like, actually, you know, it, it's really important to do what feels authentic and right. And I think that every single day, every single week, there's the, those continuous decisions. And you can probably tell from a number of the stories that we've talked about today that a lot of the decisions we have, have haven't been normal. <laughs> um, but I think that what's so important is to build a company that feels right to you um, and to make a decision based on all of the information that you have. Go and speak to everyone, the best in the world, um, but then to make authentic decisions based on what you think is best for the company. Um, and I think, yeah, that's been utterly critical. You know, I look around Canva and I feel so proud of so many of the different aspects that we've made those hard decisions. Um, it, was, it was funny, I was speaking to a journalist the, the other day and they said, are you going to bring in an experienced CEO? And I was like, that's a great question. <laughs> um, but I guess the reality is, you know, we're, we're building a company that hasn't necessarily been built before. And so yesterday, if, if I'd been airlisted in and we had 700 staff, I probably would have been a bit scary. But yesterday we had 699 staff. Wow. And so, you know, every single day you sort of just build up a little bit and you grow a little bit more, it's sort of like that ladder. You just continuously, you get to the next stage and you've learnt all the things from the previous stages and then you get a little bit more confident to build the company for the next stage. I think specifically for me, if, you know, why I talk about mission and goals so much and why the, the importance of dreaming, I think is if I didn't have dreams for the future and if I didn't have a strong mission and a strong vision of where I'd like to lead the company, I can't lead. Mm. Um, that's so critical to me. Um, and I think, you know, if that changed, that would be, you know, I probably shouldn't be the CEO anymore, but fortunately we've, we've still got a long way to go. 
actually we have a derogatory term around Blackbird of safe pair of hands, which are never, <laughs> never ever safe um, uh, when you bring in, you know, experienced. Um, but maybe even flipping that question onto um, hiring and promoting within, and um, I think there's been a number of really uh, wonderful stories of people who have risen through the ranks of Canva and your philosophy around, um, you know, perhaps taking a chance on those people in promotions versus bringing in external help and where it works and where, you know, for positions it, you know, doesn't work. Yeah, I think one of the things that we think a lot about internally is goals. And so to me, I really don't care about titles in any way whatsoever. <laughs> I care about goals. And so I, I love seeing someone who starts with a little goal and they do an amazing job of that goal. And then they get a little more confident or they get a little bit more experience and they're ready to take on another goal. And then they get ready to take on bigger and bigger goals. And I think it's the same as that ladder. It's like you get a little more experience and you get a little bit more prepared and you're ready to take on another goal. You know, we've had people at Canvas since our earliest days and they've gone from managing a blog to now managing you know, huge numbers of people people and um, taking on ridiculously massive goals. And that brings me a great, great joy. Um, and so I, I really think, you know, when I said that we're a mission and goal-driven company, that's utterly true. And I think bringing on people, um, I think being able to find people that can help us to achieve our goals, that's the, that's the critical essence of, of our hiring, is people that are really willing to dig in and to take on these crazy big goals. That's actually one of our company values, is set crazy big goals and make them happen. Excellent. I think we've answered the CEO um, in, in the previous question. How were you funding yourself and your team before you raised investment? Were you bootstrapping, doing contract work? Yeah, so with our first company, we were um, bootstrapping. Um, but we didn't know that term at the time, so <laughs> we didn't think there was another option. Um, and so, yeah, we had to become profitable really, really quickly with the first company or we would immediately not have a company. So that's why we had the printing presses that Fuji Xerox lent us and we just had to pay for the paper and the ink. Um, and we had to become profitable really quickly. And we were trying just everything under the sun to make that work. So uh, we have a very lovely family who came in and were like, we did a mail campaign to every school in Australia where we literally printed out these letters and stuffed them in envelopes and stuck on the things, uh, the, the stamps, and sent them out to every school in Australia. And Cliff um, had a hilarious thing where he'd call up the schools and be like, hey, um, so someone's left an inquiry on our website, uh, but they, they didn't leave their name. <laughs> um, then he like did that for every school in Australia, and then we said that was mail campaign. Still doing that, isn't he? <laughs> well, actually, we are thinking of a few mail campaigns. But it's like, um, yeah, so that was that. We were like you know going to, just trying everything we possibly could. Um, I remember when we first got our first hundred dollar check. We thought that was the most exciting thing ever. Um, it was from a school. We were in Perth, they were in Sydney, and we're like, oh my god, the internet. <laughs> um, so yeah, it, I think that it was it was really important to bootstrap um, for us. And I, yeah, I think that I'm glad and grateful that we accidentally had all of that time without that external funding because I think that that really helped us to to build a lot of um, expertise and um, to get a really solid picture of what we wanted to achieve. And that's a good segue into, you know, what is it like to do a startup with Cliff and your partner? <laughs> um, I think, well, firstly, it's, I can't imagine really the alternative, personally. I mean, <laughs> because it's such an adventure and it's such a roller coaster. And, you know, if I'm working until five o'clock in the morning <laughs> or whatever it might be, um, he's really grateful that I'm working so hard and he's like, thank you for working on the company and vice versa. And I think that getting to share that together is, it's been really cool. And it's, I mean, it's certainly, you know, it's, this, if we have a Venn diagram, it's sort of like people say relationships and businesses and right in the middle is probably the, the, the hardest part, <laughs> but it's, it's good fun. I can't really imagine it any other way. Do you have any tips for people in the audience um, who are you're running businesses with their partner or with any? Um, I think that mission and goals session that I was talking about before is really critical. So getting a clear picture of where you want to go in the future um, and having that as really common and shared understanding. I think for any partnership or any, you know, any team, that's 
to me, one of the most critical things. Because if you're not aligned on the big stuff, if you're not aligned on where you want to go, then every small decision will be a billion times harder. And so if you have a really clear understanding of where you want to go, um, every other decision can sort of happen a lot more in parallel. You can sort of do your own things because you know that you're working towards the bigger thing. Um, so yeah, getting as much alignment on the future is, is utterly critical for any, any, um, any team, any... Any kind of any relationship. Yeah. Excellent. Cyber attacks have been an issue for huge corporations, including large banks. Can you tell us how you worked through the security breach that happened earlier this year? Yeah, so we have a really incredible security team. We've been doubling down on that, doubling down on the security features, um, you know, everything from SSO to multi-factor authentication. Um, yeah, I think that you can't over-invest in security. We have had we had a security team, but now we have a much larger security team. It's such a critical um, area to invest in. Cool. Three years following the first rejection from the Silicon Valley investor, what made it possible for you con to continue? I think we might have answered that one with the Fusion Books um, uh, story. Are you planning on offering indigenous languages on Canva? Yes, this is a great source of pride, actually. So we have Canva in 100 languages. So the vast majority of um, our users are in the, you know, the top 10, 30 languages. But we made a really conscientious decision to ensure that Canva was offered in the 100 languages. Um, there's a concept that we spend a lot of time um, looking into called the digital divide. And the digital divide is that the vast majority of the internet is available only in a small number of languages, um, which means that people who, are, uh, who speak are not mo the majority of the internet, they're often really banded off from being able to access today's technology and the internet and information. And so the digital divide is the, you know, the, the from like language number 20 to, to 100, they often don't have access um, to, to a lot of the information and technology we have available today. So yeah, Canva's in 100 languages, um, and that's a, a really important aspect of that. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Uh, we talked a little bit about the, the management structure and, and the 18 um, uh, teams. How has that changed over time, and how have you sort of adjusted it and fine-tuned it? Yeah. So in our early days, um, we were one team and we had one goal, which was launch Canva. Um, and then we started to grow and we're about 20 people, I think, I think, you know, 20, 30 people and we start to be like, hang on a second, we're not achieving as much per person as we had done in the early days. Um, and it was at that point in time that we decided to split into smaller teams and to each have those mission and goals. I showed you one of the posters that we put on the wall. But I think sticking up the goals on the wall was a really critical thing because it meant that we all had alignment, sort of helped to distill the noise from uh, the goals from the noise of the day to day, um, and that was sort of the starting point for uh, forming into these uh, different teams. And then we had we had I think 80 teams at one stage, and then we had to split those teams into groups. So now we have groups of teams, but now we're actually starting to think. Now we're almost getting too many groups, and so I think we're about to have groups of groups. <laughs> so it's a continuous. It's like it's kind of cells dividing. Um, you just have to continuously evolve um, as, as your company grows. And what about the the idea of platform teams and um, uh, obviously on the technical side, but also you know the finance team and uh, sort of the, the nuance around the platform team versus product team. Right? Yeah, so something that we did with our finance and legal group, um, we just started doing it last year, was that each of our groups would have their own P&L. Um, and so we started to really think about our platform groups as a startup incubator for the other groups in the company. Um, so we have like a brand and marketing group that is helping each of the different other groups to have the best brand and marketing in the world. Um, and so starting to think about how can we spin up multi-billion dollar um, companies as quickly as we can so we have a coaching team that helps with like psychological safety and activities um, so yeah it's still it's constantly a work in progress I definitely should should note that every single thing we're doing is constantly being improved and constantly being refined um, but yeah that strategy has been working well. Are there other companies that you've taken inspiration from or are being built alongside Canva that has a similar f philosophical outlook and I've heard that Spotify has a similar model okay, of yeah. groups, but um, I think they call it tribes and something else. Um, yeah, but it's, it's definitely been, we sort of speak to a lot of people, we hear a lot about their things that they love, a lot of the things that they don't love, um, and just continuously try to refine it for, our, for, our, for what feels authentic and right for us. Excellent. 
talk about Guy Kawasaki and um, bringing on an ambassador and uh, you know how that journey has unfolded. Yeah, so even how you met Guy in the first place is an interesting story. Yeah, yeah so Guy had tweeted a Canva design um, and. Um, Cliff found it on Twitter. Uh, we reached out to him and um, we were going to be in San Francisco and that's where he lives and so we all caught up. Um, and he said, I'm 59 and I've... So he was the chief evangelist at Apple. Um, and he said, I'm 59 and I've got one last big thing in me and I think this is it. <laughs> um, then he joined, he joined Canva and he really helped put Canva on the world stage and to make us seem a lot bigger than we were. You know, we were, I think, 20 people at the time. Um, and it really helped Canva to seem a, a, lot, more, a lot more serious. Mm. What are the activities that have been most impactful that he's done in his role, uh, like some of the conferences or uh, uh, social media, obviously, but uh, yeah, so he of an gets ambassador. invited to every conference under the sun, um, and he's been promoting Canva very avidly as our chief evangelist, um, and you know he's got incredible connections across the globe as well that's helped us put us in front of some really incredible people. Excellent, that is time. So everybody, please put your hands together and thank Mel.